factum. It says right there, underlined in yellow, it says uh, right there, no, we are not separating. So what that means on the bottom of page page 4 and page 5 of the factum, that means that we called the bank nine months before our separation date, because before our separation date we moved. We moved from Calgary to Redcliffe, which is just outside Medicine Hat. We called the bank, did a mortgage application, and she called us back and she says, oh, we're skeptical about, uh, about uh, are you separating? I think it was the first I ever heard of it. But I did call my ex-wife, Rhonda Sales. I said, you know, what's this? She goes, oh, she's, so she called the banker pretty much like behind my back and I didn't know about it. Like nine months before separation, you know, because, you know, sometimes couples fight on and off. And so this was like nine months before our actual actual separation date where she called the bank, you know, months before, it could have been a year before, where she said that, uh, I want to take over the mortgage of the house from Mr. Afton because we're separating. And she did not deny saying that to me. She did not deny it. So I don't know wh where these judges found something where Miss Afton de denied a statement. But according to me, she did not deny any statement at all. She admitted to me, she admitted to the banker that she said that er earlier that we're separating and we had to actually convince because at the time we were not separating. We were fighting and she was thinking of separating. She called the banker and we actually do separate like nine months later. But the thing is what happened nine months prior, her denying a statement has nothing to do with it. But the bottom line is it's, a, it's an outright lie. I want Allison Redford to get to the bottom of these lies, the pack of lies that's on my appeal by uh, uh, judges Carol Conrad, Peter Martin, Alexander Park. I want them to uh, to explain these lies, where they ca where they actually came up with lie number one, two, three, and four. Put a reason behind it. Show me where uh, they found. Something was according to Mr. Atkins, such as lie number one and three that you see here. I want, I want those judges to show me where they found that in the appeal books. I want, and then I want, just like lie number two, I want that those judges to show me in the appeal books where it says that uh, Mrs. Sales denied a statement. Well, back when she used to be Mrs. Atkins. I want to, I want to be shown. I want, I want to be. I want you to prove this as not being a lie, because I have proven it to be a lie here. Want to see lie number four? You'll see the ambush video. But before we do that, I'm going to get into telling you what laws that I was deprived by Justice Horner, and that was the Court of Appeals judges. They had to protect the integrity of her. Deprived me of the of what laws she deprived me of, and the law that the. The law that she deprived me of was uh, Section 28 of the Canada Evidence Act, and uh, and the rules of court that she deprived me of was uh, Alberta Rule Court 158.5, subsection 1E. And uh, so now we're going to get in on with the. Uh, I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why and how. We're going to listen to how I was actually deprived. You know how justice. Here's, we're going to listen to how Justice Horner jumped into, jumped over the boundary law and the rules of court, and how she made me answer to exhibits that I knew nothing about, exhibits that were never adduced into the trial, and they could not be adduced. And that was the main reason why the Court of Appeals panel judges lied. They came up with a fictional, bogus judgment. And now you know, you know the laws, now we're going to listen to how she actually, how her and Rhonda Sales ambushed me. And my wife said, Remember, she's a uh, a government employee too, so of course government employees they actually all they're all in cahoots with each other. Um, may I present yep. the exhibits right away to both you and I? Yeah, you said that you wanted to question Mr. Actimon, you go ahead and give him a copy and me a copy, that would be correct. Can I come across? You give them to the Madam Clerk and she'll hand them to Mr. Actimon and myself. Thank you. 
Okay, maybe just for ease of reference, Ms. Acton, we'll just mark this as Exhibit 2 right now. Okay. And this is a uh, bundle of documents uh, lettered alphabetically from A through R. Yeah. Why don't you give me a few minutes to go through this? You'll have some opportunity. Well, Ms. Acton gets to ask you a question. Oh, okay. Like, your evidence is finished, Mr. Acton. Gotcha. She's just <laughs> asking you a question. She'll give you an opportunity. She may not direct you to all of these documents, no. okay? When you get to cross Ms. Acton, you can use these documents at that time when you go to cross-examine her, okay? So Madam Clerk will mark that as Exhibit 2. Before I get into lie number uh, 5 and 6, that's going to be the real kicker. Because uh, lie number... Because we know from what I've just showed you that they didn't read the appeal material. And that's what lie number... Uh, the next lie is, lie number 5. It says, we have read the... A, a material. They did not read it. That's the biggest joke that there is. Just as we saw the uh, first uh, f uh, four lies, lie number one, two, three, and four on paragraphs number one, two, and three. Now we're going on to uh, paragraph uh, number four and five, which contains contain lies number lie number five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, and twelve. Uh, the 12th lies at the very end where it says that she did. Uh, 13, that's going to be on the uh, the last part of paragraph 5, which is on page 2, and that's that's the end of the uh, the lies. So we have a total of 13 lies. I'm going to take you through all the lies. Lie number 5 states, we have read the ma material submitted. Well, we know from, from yourself viewing the last video, part 2 of 3, and part... Uh, one of three, if you went through that, you know that they didn't read my uh, appeal material to full comprehension. They have skimmed through it, and we know that the lot from lies number one, two, three, and four. We know that those we know that those lies are lies. Number six, uh, lie number six. We find no basis for appellant intervention. Well, let me show you my basis for appellant intervention. Contrary to lie number six, we find no basis for appellant intervention. I'm going to read from the factum, paragraph two, page two. Miss Actum served new surprise, uh, surprised exhibits to Mr. Actum. Mr. Actum did not realize that these were different exhibits from what Miss Actum had filed as per her pretrial material. Not until being cross-examined by Ms. Actum did Mr. Actum realize that these were exhibits in which Mr. Actum was not provided enough time to recall before having to answer to these new, new surprise exhibits. Mr. Actum feels he could have answered to Ms. Actum's question, questions about those emails better. Only if Ms. Actum and Justice Horner would have respected Civil Practice Note 5 and he feels he could have answered Ms. Actum's cross-examination better than feeling ambushed and answering to emails other than I cannot recall. Appellant's factum, third paragraph.